FJC 10256, Commonwealth versus Little. Good morning, Mr. Kramer. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, this is my first time uh, here in the SJC, uh, so I might be a little rough, but this is January 6th in some traditions, Little Christmas, so I hope it's a good day for defendants, because I represent uh, the defendant in this case, Christopher Little. Mr. Little had a half ounce of marijuana on him. The only evidence of an intent to distribute was uh, the opinion of a police officer and uh, defense contention is that this opinion is not deserving of the name evidence because evidence must uh, pass the test of reliability. May, may, may I just, so we're on the same wavelength, not only did he have um, the half an ounce of marijuana in 15 smaller plastic bags, but he also had $254 and a cell phone, right? Yes, Judge. Okay. And the question would be, how much uh, does that advance the analysis? Um, as the officer conceded, everyone has a cell phone. Even my nine-year-old daughter wants one. Uh, cell phones does not advance the analysis very much because they are just so universal. And but doesn't, doesn't this reliability theory of the evidence have to be tested in a pretrial motion under the Lanigan case? Your Honor, uh, it would have been advisable for this attorney, uh, try the case, trial attorney, to have done that. But he did bring the uh, uh, matter to the attention of the judge by way of a required finding. And he... Uh, well, it's too late then, isn't it? You have to do it before trial. If Your Honor, please, uh, if on analysis the, uh, the judge looks at this and says, you're right, this opinion is built on sand, it is uh, not enough to get over the rail of required finding. Uh, but how can the judge tell it at that point? I mean, if you really want it tested by means of a Lanigan hearing or some other such hearing, how can the judge tell it, test it at the time of the motion for required finding? Well, he's had the benefit of the cross-examination, the direct, the cross, and uh, the officer has said, I'll tell you what my opinion is based on. I simply haven't uh, run into anyone who's had 15 bags for what I consider personal use, and therefore it doesn't exist. And, uh, I've, and I've made how many arrests? Close if, to if you're on 200, please. close to 200, is that what he said? Transactions involving marijuana? And he thousands? He has been involved, well, he says he's been involved in a thousand uh, cases, which would be uh, one a week for 20 years. And, Could uh, be, why trials. wouldn't it be more than one a week? I'm sorry, a why thousand trials, if Your Honor, please. Okay. And okay. what I'm suggesting is that I'm sure this officer has a lot of anecdotal evidence, but the plural of anecdote is not reliable knowledge. Uh, you have to make lots of observations under lots of different circumstances. Mr. Could I ask you this? I mean, there are obviously a, a number of cases in which the, this court has said we allow police to testify as experts in, certain, you know, in, in drug cases. Are you suggesting that we should disavow those cases and go a different way, or are you saying that those are okay, but on these facts, this particular person was beyond the pale? Well, Judge, I, I would want it all. I would want you to. Uh, <laughs> uh, Since this is the Christmas. frankincense Since and the murder. Not, not right? always the best strategy. <laughs> not always the best strategy. <laughs> this uh, is Christmas. Right. What I'm suggesting, and the reason why I asked for direct appellate review, is that under the rubric of my training and experience, just about anything gets in. Now, the, uh, this court in Commonwealth versus Patterson did uh, the analysis on the partial fingerprint. Uh, analysis and really uh, brought law enforcement into line about, hey, we don't want your impressions or your anecdotes. Uh, have you tested this theory that, for instance, a person, users don't have uh, small packets? And uh, how did you go about testing it? And what's your error rate? And is this exposed to any sort of public criticism that is peer review, not by your colleagues, but by independent researchers? And I cite in my brief uh, 
independent researchers who do this kind of work, who uh, buy uh, with certificates of uh, immunity from the federal government, send people out to buy and compare prices, compare weights. There's a How can we decide this question on this record? I, I, isn't this more appropriately left for a motion for a new trial? Your Honor, I'm, from what I understood, the officer gave his opinion and there's nothing more to give. You, uh, can, you, could, you can question the credibility of it, the, the, the weight of it. Uh, th th that's the time, once it's in, once it's admissible, you try to knock his block off on cross-examination. That's, that's the remedy that you have. Well, the problem with that is what the court has said with respect to other expert testimony, um, and that's why we have the Daubert rule, they said cross-examination just doesn't work. In limine, uh, there should be, the, the trial court should bar the testimony if it's not reliable. But, but, but the, there wasn't an in limine motion. I think uh, the uh, trial counsel ought to have brought one. Um, and I think it's, though, saved that uh, by his uh, required finding motion because it, it seems obvious that on, this, on these facts, the uh, officer cited as the basis of his opinion, they just do not carry uh, enough weight for a rational finder of fact. Well, you would, you would concede, I take it, that there's lots of testimony that an experienced police officer can give with respect to the methods used by persons who sell drugs. I mean, they don't have to go out and do an international study on how to package uh, cocaine or what's ordinarily used to package it for distribution. You can testify based on sufficient experience in the area as to what has been observed, can't you? Does that have if to go through some sort of scientific study? Consistent observations. For instance, the officer, when asked, well, he concedes that there are some sellers who prepackage, you know, prepackage it in small amounts because it's quicker, more convenient. You don't want to be weighing stuff out on the street if you're selling on the street. The officer says, well, these prepackagers, they wouldn't sell one for $10, uh, three for 25, 10 for 75 because they wouldn't make enough money. Now that's his opinion. He's never observed this sort of uh, dealings, he's never asked about it, he's never inquired it into it by this testimony, and what he's doing is arguing. So, so the way, I, but I guess, and I suppose that's, that is an interesting point, it's probably a very good point, and, and it might be that with respect to that area, the officer was testifying beyond his expertise in an area in which his testimony would not be reliable. And that was challenged, but it, I mean, the point here, that, was that challenged at the time, Your Honor, I object to this testimony because he's now testifying in an area where he's not reliable? No, he was not challenged no. at the time he gave the testimony, only, only at the required finding stage, Your Honor, please. Uh, the officer does not know how much uh, this gentleman paid, uh, Mr. Little <coughs> paid for it, but the officer's testimony is whatever he paid, he paid too much because obviously he knew where to get bulk quantities if he wanted. And again, that's speculation. There's nothing in there that says uh, Mr. Little knew or should have known or that, uh, that he had alternate routes. Uh, it may well be that some people don't have a connection as a regular dealer. They lose their connection because he's been arrested uh, or dies or goes to jail. Um, for any number of reasons, it simply is not rational for him to suppose that you always have the option of buying uh, large quantities from one dealer. In fact, the smaller dealers may want to protect their sources, both in terms of confidentiality and not tell them where to buy the big amount, and also economically not want to pass up a sale, but may in instead prefer to give a, a, a quick sale on their own terms. Um, basically, I would just suggest that, the, that police testimony uh, in this area is highly unregulated, and I've never seen it um, submit, uh, actually an, analyzed under Dolbert in any Massachusetts decision. Have you, have you ever seen, are you aware, Mr. Romer, of, of anybody who 
has actually moved and been denied a motion or has actually had a motion, you know, had, a, had some kind of a hearing on this reliability question in this area? Uh, I have. Okay, but not in this, front of Judge obviously. Becto at a jury, wire, uh, jury waived uh, trial, and of course he issued a ultimate verdict for p simple possession, uh, so there was no need for a uh, ruling on the Dobert motion. Uh, but, but you had a Dobert hearing? Yes, Judge, a preliminary hearing where I challenged the admissibility of the. Uh, and did that, is the result of that hearing, did he limit the officer in what he could and couldn't testify about as an expert, or was he, it all? What he did is he said he'd take my motion under advisement, <clears throat> and then without ruling on the motion per se, found the uh, gentleman uh, guilty of possession only. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <so laughs> he that did too different. good a jab. <laughs> uh, and I suggest that the court ought to impose this sort of Dober analysis. What was the quantity involved in that case? That was a cocaine case, if Your Honor, please. Uh, no, I'm sorry, a heroin case. Uh, I'm trying to think of the exact number of pills. Uh, can, can I switch you? Sure. If, if you don't mind, is that all right? I don't mind. Um, with respect to the um, admission of the, of the prior convictions, is it clear? I, is it clear that it was admitted only under the statute for credibility purposes? As I recall, the uh, uh, judge indicated that if the defendant testified, he would admit it. Uh, and there was a, a discussion where... So that's the inference, that it was coming... It, is that right? I mean, because you know, because you could see, depending on what the testimony was, it might come in for another purpose. That is, is impeachment, or you know, because I think that the Commonwealth cites one or more cases where it came in for different purposes. But I took it from your brief that this was this was under the statute, or that was the way that that you seem to be yes, the Commonwealth, presenting it. The Commonwealth. Uh, as I recall, the colloquy between the judge and the defense counsel, the uh, defense counsel said this is terribly prejudicial. Um, uh, it's a prior same sort of act case. And the judge said, well, that makes it all the more relevant. And uh, then defense counsel said, yeah, but it makes it more prejudicial. And then the judge said, well, yes, but uh, uh, his credibility is at issue here. Who was the judge? Uh, his name was... Uh, Deneen? Uh, Deenan, I Deenan. think. Deenan. Uh, I'm Deenan. not familiar with him. Um, and the, the, the um, had somebody moved the Commonwealth either to admit under, uh, what is it, 233 section 20, whatever it is, yeah. or, or had you, or not you, but had the, had the trial attorney moved to, to preclude? Yes, uh, the trial attorney made a motion to exclude and the judge denied that motion. And it was in the context of discussing that motion that this came up? Yes, Judge. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just like to conclude because I, I cite some uh, pre-Dober uh, cases. Uh, and most of them deal with civil penalties, but um, this is a criminal case where someone's liberty is at stake and where the likelihood of arrest uh, falls heaviest on inner city dwellers. Um, and I think under these circumstances, uh, the court ought to require great scrutiny of this, at least as much as it would in a civil case where someone is just suing for a uh, slip and fall. I take it that if this incident had happened on January 2nd, 2009 or later, we wouldn't be here. N if Your Honor, please, he still would have been charged as a dealer under those circumstances. Oh, so it would, even so, even with his quantity? According to the police officer, yes. And I, I don't know how this will play out. Um, I'm just asking the court to send the message that if you want to testify uh, as an expert, um, you must play by the rules of expertise. But, but it, well, aside from some parts of it, such as Justice Cordy mentioned, isn't that up to the defense lawyer to bring up? Because the judge doesn't say, okay, let's have a Lanigan hearing now. And the Commonwealth isn't going to say it. 
Yes, and that's, and that, it, <coughs> I can see that uh, it would have been better practice for the uh, defense attorney to have uh, brought a hearing, but I don't think the uh, judge, when he heard the basis of the opinion, uh, was, uh, it was such that any credible, or I'm sorry, any rational trier of fact would have uh, given it no weight. And there was a cite to uh, Judge Oak's case from the Second Circuit, I think it was uh, United States versus Bosolet. Uh, to that effect, and it was cited in the uh, defendant's memorandum. Thank you, Mr. Lear. Thank you. Ms. Kagan? Good morning, Chief Justice Marshall, Justices. My name is Christine Kagan. I'm an Assistant District Attorney from Plymouth County representing the Commonwealth. Initially, uh, Your Honors, the Commonwealth would point out here that there was a waiver uh, regarding I this landing issue. I think the Justices. Yes. Oh, well, aware of that, so we either in ineffective assistance of counsel or substantial risk, correct? Well, yes, yes, Chief Justice. The, uh, there was no uh, abuse of discretion here in allowing in this testimony. If I, first I could address the abuse of discretion aspect, because under Commonwealth versus Powell, uh, even if such a challenge had been made, that being pursuant to Lanigan, which of course wasn't done, the defendant would now have to show that the admission of this testimony was an abuse of discretion by the trial judge. Well, was there a, a motion to admit this testimony to Bene, or did the judge say, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve the question of admissibility until after I hear the testimony? Anything like that? There was no such pretrial, uh, there was no, obviously no pretrial request for a Lanigan hearing, but no, Your Honor. There was not any uh, dialogue, there was not any request by either side for a voir dire on the qualifications of Detective Keating. Uh, or for the basis of his opinions or the underlying methodologies or uh, uh, just a simple voir dire regarding his qualifications. There was no such request made. They simply went straight into the trial. Uh, and I'd point out that the detective that testified as an expert in this case was from the Brockton Police Department. This uh, was not the town that this offense occurred in. It occurred in a neighboring that town. Mean? that being Whitman. I'm what, sorry. What difference does that make? That makes a big difference because there are certainly uh, cases in the uh, intent to distribute line of the in intent right. to distribute line of cases which talk about uh, discouraging a percipient witness oh no no I, I see no it's not that it's a different town you, you, you're talking about the percipient witness percipient, town. yes I bring okay, that up so, I mean you could have a, the same town but not a percipient witness certainly you? and, okay. and that, that that happens often are, are, uh, when you when you say about um, you want to talk about abuse of discretion is that because you're saying even if there had been a request for a Lanigan hearing and one had been held there is absolutely nothing wrong with the, this admission of this testimony yes your honor that's exactly what I'm saying uh, w the do way you, do, that this do you have to go there in other words well, isn't it better just to do this the slate substantial I mean we haven't had a Lanigan hearing so we can't right. possibly speculate it so isn't it better just to do a slate substantial risk of a likelihood of a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice? Certainly, certainly. Uh, and, and, and again, just to explain why, why I bring that up, is that that's, what, that's what this appeal was based on. Uh, as you've read, the, the appeal was, uh, it was a sufficiency argument, but weaved into that or woven into that was this Lanigan argument. So certainly uh, my response in the Commonwealth's brief addressed the, uh, the Lanigan issue uh, as well, I wove that in with sufficiency as well. Uh, Detective Keating in this case, and I, I just it, just revisit that for one minute just to clear that up. He didn't testify in this case as any kind of a scientific expert, and, that, and that's very critical. Uh, he testified as an expert who gains his, exper his expertise from his experience. And it's very commonsensical. It's very commonsensical for me to present it that way, but it's very commonsensical at a trial. He's not coming in here with any new science or any... Uh, uh, no, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be reliable and isn't subject absolutely. to being tested by Lanigan if you wanted to do that. Absolutely. My, my point is that it is a much more plain and straightforward task for the judge initially to decide if he's qualified well, and I mean for that, the jury. That, uh, you may be correct, but you may be incorrect. In other words, I think... I, I'm not asking this next I, I'm not asking you to concede in any way that this is waived, 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 waived. So that's fine. Okay, well, it's waived. Um, but um, essentially, the, 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 the gist of the argument is, uh, and I think uh, Mr. Lehmer said it rather plainly, under the rubric of, quote, my training and experience, almost anything gets in. 
And it seems to me that that's a perfectly appropriate way to look at this, simply because he's not a, quote, scientific expert, doesn't mean to say that because he's based only on his experience that anything gets in. And in that regard, have you looked at the amicus brief? Yes, um, I have. And what's your view with respect to that? Not, well, not whether or not we should reach those questions. It's waived. But essentially the point that they are making is that our jurisprudence is all over the place. With respect to the expert testifying? Um, with respect to when police officers testify based on their, quote, experience. That, that if you looked at the Supreme Judicial Court jurisprudence, you would not have a very clear map as to what a uh, thoughtful prosecutor would do in circumstances like this. Well, I think that, I think that the line of cases is specific as to the expertise. It's not this catch-all, I'm experienced, so anything I say goes. I disagree with that. If you look at what the cases are saying, they're talking about specific objective factors that these police, been, uh, these police detectives, 20-year experience in this particular case, but they see time and time again. It's routine from their experience to see, for example, in this case, someone who is going to buy, uh, it's a simple economic ar argument, someone who's going to buy that, this amount of marijuana for their personal use is based on this officer's training and experience. And again, it's from what he's seen. Uh, they're going to buy it in bulk. It's cheaper, and they're not going to buy it individually packaged. That's, that's an objective factor that an officer has seen based on his experience. Is there, are there facts in the record that it's cheaper? That is, that is the yes. gist. Yes. He specifically says that. He specifically says that a seller isn't going to sell the individual packages yeah, you, for the same price. You're just asserting these things. When he says a seller isn't going to sell based on? Based on his training and experience. Yes, but we don't have evidence. Is there separate evidence? I, I, I went to buy, and I was told that I could buy in bulk. I don't know what bulk is, but half an ounce, mm -hmm. right? And I, w and I was told if I took it in bulk, it would cost me how much? Did he say? Did the officer say? It, he said it would cost half of what? Did he say what? How much would cost? Yes, he did. He, he, he gave a price, a scale of prices. He, did, he gave a scale of prices, but he didn't specify with respect to that half amount. He said that the amounts that he viewed inside of the one single bag were 15 individual packets. There were $10 bags, dime bags and eighths, which will cost $25. And he said half ounce bags are, are common, half ounce being approximately the, 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 uh, um, the conglomeration of the 15 separate bags that were sold in, or yes. that were in possession if in this were, case. If it weren't individually packaged, he a didn't half weigh ounce them bag, though, right? he said, would cost $75. He did say that. Uh, and, he, and he clearly said. And that these were dime bags? These are dime bags and eighths based on, uh, he didn't weigh them, this was an estimate, and he was very clear about that both on direct and cross-examination. He was handed the exhibit which contained the 15 bags, he looked at it, and he, based on, again, his 20 years of training and experience, he felt that they, they, they were consistent with dime bags and eighths, the dime bags costing 10, the eighths costing $25, and what he said was, if, uh, based on his training and experience, and again, his training and experience isn't just out there sitting in a cruiser, Watching no, 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 nobody's, do, nobody's questioning his correct. training and experience. So his training and experience includes, and he specifically testified this. So, this. so, so I take it that, that, that if he was cross-examined in, in this respect in some ways, in some of the same kinds of ways that a real estate appraiser might be uh, cross-examined in, 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 in arriving at a value of something based on comparables. Um, in, in adding in and in, in detracting out or subtracting out certain kinds of factors, like does the house have a, two bathrooms or one? Um, is, this, is this packaged, uh, you know, how is this packaged? Is, it, is, it, is there a half ounce in one bag or are there 15 small bags uh, with, um, with one fifteenth of an ounce each? The cross-examination focused more on, well, what if I'm a buyer and I want to buy and I, I can't find it anywhere else? And I'm, the words weren't used exactly like this, but I'm desperate to buy, so I just take it at however the seller has it. And that was how it was, that's how his opinion was challenged on cross-examination. It was, um, well, the, the, the assertion by defense counsel, and uh, it was a vigorous cross-examination along those lines, where, uh, uh, is, isn't it, you, you can't say for sure that he's buying, uh, not buying for personal use. 
based on the packaging here. And again, the detective was, was clear each time, not only on direct but also on cross, that he kept saying, from what I've seen, based on my training and experience. And again, going back to what I was saying about his experience, his experience includes purchasing drugs undercover, purchasing marijuana undercover. And that's very significant because he's not just on the sidelines. Uh, he's not just relying on what's told to him by informants or by people that he arrests. This is first-hand knowledge. During his 20 years, he's out there in the street, street level, buying drugs undercover. <laughs> he knows the economics of it. He knows that a buyer, he, he's talked to the users during his 20-year career, but he's also bought he's, as a user, undercover, pretending that he's a user. So he's, he's, he's very familiar with the economics. The economics work on both sides. The economics that it's cheaper for the buyer uh, and it's more, it makes more sense. It's a common sense argument. It's, it's, it's common sense that he's, he's explaining this to a jury because it is outside their knowledge whether or not something's intended for distribution. They're not, it's not something <coughs> they encounter every day, but what, but what isn't outside their common knowledge is the law of economics. That's a reasonable methodology underlying his opinion that they can relate to. It makes sense to them, or I at least it should make sense. A reasonable person can grasp that kind of theory. Uh, whereas, uh, and the other thing he talked about here, we haven't addressed, is uh, another factor here was that there was no smoking uh, material. And he was vigorously cross-examined as, uh, as, as to that as well. Uh, again, but his opinion is that in my, in my experience, if you're going to find someone who's a user, they're going to have some way to smoke that. And then he explained the different ways, whether it be a pipe or now, papers. Now, why is that? I mean, um this person was stopped in a car. Maybe they got their smoking stuff at home. And that was, that was explored on cross-examination, and that's a matter of weight. Uh, again, you know, it's a matter of, of, of weight for the jury. They can consider what Detective Keating is saying regarding that being significant, and they can, they're free to accept it or reject it. So, so, so I take it what you're saying is that at least with respect to the um, substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice. Uh, this this so-called expert was challenged on cross-examination in ways that were appropriate for one asserting a, an expertise in packaging sale and, and the use of drugs. Yes. Um, yes, Your Honor. Could you tell me about the the uh, prior conviction? Yes. Uh, this, this, as uh, was uh, raised. Uh, a few moments ago, there was a motion to exclude brought by the defense counsel. Under the statute? Uh, yes, a motion to exclude the, uh, the prior uh, the drug convictions. And there was uh, a dialogue uh, that's in, uh, contained in the record, and it was Judge Deneen at the Brockton District Court. Uh, and he, he uh, discussed uh, the impeachment value of, of he said, if this, this person's going to get up and take the stand, he's going to put his credibility on the line. And therefore, I make a finding that these records have substantial impeachment value. Well, if that sounds like it's under the statute, okay. and if it's under the statute, isn't this awfully close to the crime with which he was being charged? Well, it's, it, it, certainly, it certainly is, but it, it, don't we have some cases that say something about that? Well, but there, there, you, have case, you have general cases which talk about similarity and the danger of that, absolutely. But this is, there are is also specific cases that talk about uh, prior acts of drug distribution. Yes, when someone those, gets up but, there. But that's, that's when it's being used for something other than the statute. That's if he testifies, I don't know what a... You know, I don't know what an ounce is, or I don't know what something is, and then, well, yes, you do, because, in fact, you were convicted of selling this exact stuff. I mean, that's a different matter, isn't it? It isn't. The, the, uh, uh, respectfully, the Goldman case uh, states that the prior bad acts of drug distribution may be admitted to prove a defendant's intent with regard to drugs found in his possession if the prejudice to the defendant is outweighed by the probative value of the prior bad acts. Right. That's, that's my a different point. use. That's, right. that's a different use. That's right. not for credibility under the statute. Well the, well, the the way that the judge the judge phrased it, I don't think the judge was un, I, he may have phrased it that way, but I think he was clear that they were, he was only admitting them for impeachment value. No, yes. I thought he was clear that they were coming in one way or another. He said, "I'm exercising." Well, uh, at least that's my impression. He says it was the SJC that carved out an area of judicial discretion. I am exercising my discretion to say that the convictions can come in. That's under the statute. And, and, the, and under the statute, they only come in for impeachment. But I think it's problematic. Myself. Didn't the judge, I heard, perhaps it was you earlier, saying, yeah, because it is so similar. 
that, uh, that was, there was another case where uh, that was problematic. Um, I, I thought think that. That was the, wasn't it the, that was the judge who said that case? in this case? Uh, I, I thought Mr. Lema said the judge said that in this case. Not to my understanding. Uh, okay. The, the, the Gilfoyle case, which is cited in, in, his, in his brief, there it was a problem where the trial judge considered the similarity of the crimes, and he actually used that as a basis for admitting uh, the prior. I mean, that, that, that's a separate case. We okay. don't have that kind of language from Judge Deneen in this particular case. Isn't that what case. he means? Oh. I'm sorry? Isn't that in substance what he was saying? I, I don't think it was, respectfully, I don't think that's in substance what he was saying, no. Well, I mean, the, the court says, and I'm quoting from the, at least the brief, if the issue is did he have intent to distribute, then these prior evictions become much more relevant. Right. That's, that's what I was. Yeah, that goes, that really, did, I'm sorry, I was, I was looking for the <laughs> site. <laughs> that's what concerned me. I apologize. Right? That's why I said it looks like he was considering it and they might come in for a couple of different reasons and on a couple of different bases. All right. But, but the Commonwealth was only seeking it for impeachment purposes, correct? Yes, yes. There were different bases that were discussed. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Keegan.